guess I should start my talk by wishing you all uh, a very Merry Columbus Day. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how you're really supposed to acknowledge uh, this particular day. Um, kind of thinking about it, uh, you know, how did the, the Native American settlers of this great land refer to the day that their new world was discovered? I, I guess they probably just called it Monday, but uh, happy Monday. Um, so what I'm going to do here today is uh, just spend a little time with you describing my life uh, as a physical explorer. I've had the great good fortune to travel to some really extraordinary places. I've been to outer space, I've been deep beneath our oceans, I've been atop our tallest mountain, um, and I've been to some other pretty crazy places too that I'm going to share with you here momentarily. So I've been very, very fortunate to, uh, to go places, but for, for a purpose. Uh, I'm, I'm drawn of course, by the adventure of it, but by the challenge first and foremost and secondarily because it drives us as innovators to support human life in these extraordinary environments. And, and those things then uh, transition over into life here on Earth, uh, life uh, here at sea level. And uh, so I, my theorem here today is that extreme environments are a wonderful catalyst for innovation. This is uh, the, the youngest lava lake in the world. There are about eight to 10 of them at any one time around our planet. But what's extraordinary about this place is that it's about a 10 minute drive away from Managua, which is the capital of Nicaragua. Uh, two million uh, people live in this uh, extraordinary environment, very close to harm's way. And, um, and so it's, it's very important that we understand, characterize, and ultimately develop predictive tools that will allow us to warn people should they uh, be in a, an environment where this thing is about to blow. And so uh, this is my friend uh, Sam Cospin on the far right. You know, this is uh, probably the craziest thing I've ever done, but a uh, really important thing to do for, for science and uh, for uh, humanitarian uh, concerns. If we can install a network of sensors that uh, can predict major volcanic activity here, it could benefit many millions of people around the world. So. So uh, this expedition, uh, led by Sam Cospin and Quake, uh, basically aspired to set up a, a, an array of very uh, sophisticated sensors around this volcano, including down at the very bottom of this lava lake. We were, Sam and I were the very first two humans to actually set foot in this extraordinary place. And, um, and then we also collected a lot of other data as well, including uh, these thermal IR images uh, stitched together from drones. Uh, actually, this is a company here in San Diego called uh, Spark Aerial, run by a good friend of mine, Radley Angelo. Um, but the overarching goal is to combine all this data in sophisticated ways to develop predictive models. So this expedition was actually sponsored by General Electric GE and their Predix model. And the point I wanted to make with this kind of extraordinary expedition is that our Earth, our planet is speaking to us, our human, the human body is speaking to us. Sometimes our, our auditory acuity, our visual acuity isn't sufficient enough to actually detect what the message really is. But if we, if we really look uh, with, with new, uh, new tools, with larger data sets, we're going to be able to figure out predictive models for eruptive activity, uh, to help the 800 million people around the world that live in close proximity to volcanoes. And we'll also be able to use these same kinds of tools to predict cancer and, and other debilitating illnesses. So my, my lifetime mantra, I guess, uh, I'd share with you is that all of us fortunate enough to be in healthcare have both an opportunity and an obligation to innovate. Um, does anyone remember the SNL skit, uh, The Barber of York? Um, the, the Barber of York, his solution for any kind of medical issue was uh, bloodletting. You know, and if, if, we, if we just uh, went about our business the same way that we'd always done things, we'd still be doing bloodletting for everything that ails us. Obviously not a, the right approach. So we need to maintain a, a real drive, a, a, a sense of uh, curiosity about how can we make healthcare better all the time. Can we reduce pain? Can we make things uh, more affordable? There's so many different ways in which we can improve healthcare, and it's an exciting time to be alive, as, as, as I believe. And it's also amazing to think about how far we've come. And I'll take you uh, on, a, on a space mission here just to, uh, to give uh, some examples of how far we've, we've traveled. So in the very first uh, spacewalks in history. On the left is Alexei Leonov, the first cosmonaut, the first human being to actually venture out into the vacuum of space, and then our American Ed White taking the very first steps for the Americans. 
These guys had a very low probability of actually making it back home. In fact, the, the suits were so crudely designed and, and the cooling systems were so under capacity that uh, both of these guys barely made it back inside alive. But we've learned a lot. And what it's allowed us to do is build an extraordinary laboratory in space called the International Space Station. And I'm very fortunate to have uh, been a part of the, the construction of this and the, and the repair and maintenance of it. Um, it it's really a jewel. Uh, it's uh, 250 miles above us, traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, orbiting the Earth 16 times a day. And uh, really an extraordinary place, uh, photographed here above the Himalayas. But uh, on my last mission into space, I had a real surprise, and what I wanted to share with you is resilience and teamwork and uh, what, I, what I call MacGyverism, but you know, the, the, the ability to take something that's seemingly impossible and come up because you have to with a solution, especially in remote environments where I've had the, the privilege to work, you don't have all the tools, you don't have uh, an ICU, you don't have an operating room, you have to make do with the supplies that you brought with you, sometimes on your own back. And so this was uh, one of the solar panels that we had just deployed aboard the International Space Station. And as you can see, there's a rip there, and you might say, well, so what? Well, this solar panel is actually a limp noodle, and unless we were able to fully extend it and rigidize it, we could actually tear this thing apart. We could destroy a billion dollar national asset and taxpayers wouldn't be very happy. So we had to come up with a solution, working with a team in Houston and around the country uh, for 72 hours. They came up with a brilliant solution to send a spacewalker, turned out to be me, to install five of these sutures, essentially. We called them cufflinks. This is the, our pilot, George Zamka, holding this. Uh, Sort of an Apollo 13 moment, we had a finite limited number of supplies aboard the Space Shuttle Space Station complex. We had to couple together a solution to fix this problem. And it was absolutely brilliant. Um, we had to use a robotic system that had never been envisioned before. This is the Canada arm that I had installed on my last uh, mission, STS-100, with, with Chris Hadfield. But now, uh, on this fifth and final mission of my career, using another robotic boom that was in designed basically to inspect the space shuttle in an emergency. We cobbled this thing together in a way that had never been fashioned before. And then we took a 45-minute one-way trip out to the very tip of the space station, further than we'd ever gone before, to do surgery on the space station that we, we didn't know if it was going to work. Uh, it was really hanging it out there. Uh, it was further than we'd ever been from the safety of our airlock, so the, we're accepting a little bit higher risk than we typically would do, but sometimes the benefits of the work that we're going to try and do outweigh the risk. And this is one of those special circumstances where we had to bend the safety rules to try and do something that was really, really important. This is really uh, you know, my best day on the job ever, um, but we were able to install these cufflinks uh, very successfully and ultimately extend the solar panel. Uh, and now these solar panels are now collecting 100% of the energy that they were designed to collect and we're able to finish the International Space Station. If this hadn't happened, um, things could have turned uh, in many different ways. Um, but I like to think that even if this had not worked, there would have ultimately been a plan B or plan C because that's what NASA is so capable of doing, taking things that are seemingly impossible and making them look almost easy. But uh, certainly my best day on the job ever to be a part of this incredible team effort. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So, going into space actually challenges us in many ways. It's not only our physiology, but we have a, a limited uh, you know, station wagon that we can pile all, all of our gear into. Uh, we, we can't take the ICU, we can't take the operating room. Uh, we need to have clever, miniaturized solutions. And in fact, the space program has been an incredible catalyst for many of the technologies that we take for granted in our ICUs and operating rooms and, and clinics around the world. And this is one of my personal heroes. This is Bill Thornton call him Wild Bill, a uh, great, uh, great guy. Uh, he was hired during the Apollo program as a scientist astronaut. He didn't get a chance to go to the moon. He's a physician uh, by training. And, uh, but just a, a really prolific inventor, uh, something that I, uh, I can relate to. And so he, he was involved in so many different innovations that uh, advanced the space program including many things that advance clinical medicine here on Earth. He was one of the co-inventors of the Holzer Monitor, which of course is an ambulatory 
EKG that is used to diagnose arrhythmias, but uh, a scale, how, how do you measure weight in space? Well, you have to measure inertia. And so he created a, a very clever solution for that. Other exercise devices, he made a whole slew of you know, very seminal um, uh, discoveries about human adaptation to space as well. So a real clever guy. Um, and then there's the future, uh, which I think is going to be an amazing driver for medical innovation. I have to admit, I'm... Uh, uh, a, a fanboy of uh, Elon Musk. Uh, I'm not a, ashamed to admit it. it you probably heard uh, last week, but there was an incredible announcement by Elon and his company SpaceX that he would like to take 100 human beings and begin colon colonization of Mars. And I, I think it's just remarkable that we live in a day and age where a private citizen can propose something so outrageous, so outlandish, and people actually are taking it very seriously. Um, it's, it's, it's outlandish, but it's also possible. And so he has a, a proposal within a few years to actually create a super launch vehicle with 42 very highly powered Raptor engines at the tail of this thing and shuttle supplies and people and ultimately colonize Mars. Um, so I, I think this is really an extraordinary mind-bending uh, transformation for the human population. But how are we going to do this? This is going to require lots and lots of innovation. And so I wanted to talk about some of the unique challenges of doing this because you know, when we're up on the International Space Station, we have 24-7 communication more or less. There's very little time latency. You pick up the phone and you're talking to someone in, in mission control. But if you're on Mars, it could take 21 minutes one way. Now imagine talking to your family. Hey, how was your day, honey? And then you wait. 20 minutes for the message to get there, and then 20 minutes for that message to come back. It's not going to be the easiest, most fluid conversation. So we have to think in different ways in how we're going to support healthcare in these faraway places. And then, of course, we can use some of these great solutions to take care of people in sub-Saharan Africa and distant Nepal and uh, uh, rural North Dakota. I guess every place in North Dakota is rural, but... Um, but it, this is important, you know, I think if, if, we, if we can develop solutions that help us on this, uh, this frontier where there'll be actually capital and, and resources to make these things happen, we can bring these things into our daily lives. And so this is just a, an example of how, how hard it is to communicate the further we go. You know, at Mars, it can take 21 minutes in one direction. There are other places near Jupiter very exciting places for us to visit. Uh, Europa, Enceladus, Titan, ice-encrusted moons that actually might harbor life even to this day. And I think one day we will send humans there as well. Up to 53 minutes one way to, to communicate there. So one of my jobs uh, earlier in life, I was the uh, chief medical officer of the United States Antarctic Program's medical uh, uh, corps. So, I uh, did all the screening for everyone who went to Antarctica as part of the U.S. Antarctic program and then supported them uh, through telemedicine assets um, and other things. And so here I am at the South Pole Station and you can see uh, in the upper right, there's actually a, a clinic there and it looks like an ER in your hometown. Um, but it's very limited. There are nine months of the, the year where people can't get in or out. There are no flights in or out to the South Pole because the temperatures are so frigid cold, an airplane, a ski plane cannot physically lift off and, and do a medical evacuation. How do we support them? We, we use telemedicine assets. And so I've supported uh, performance of echocardiograms. Uh, we've, we've supported the delivery of anesthesia, telementoring from afar. So we can't be right there physically with the doc who's doing the procedure, but we can be there as a coach and helping them through. By law, any time I talk about Antarctica, I have to show a cute and cuddly picture of a, a penguin. That's uh, just, just the way it is. Um, but uh, there are other unique environments where we're, we're trying to press the boundaries of, uh, of medicine and surgery. And this is a really unique uh, experiment at the Aquarius Habitat in the Florida Keys. On the right is a Canadian astronaut, Bob Thirsk, and he's monitoring a mannequin. And um, there's a surgeon at, at the Cleveland Clinic many uh, hundreds of miles away, operating uh, a surgical robot. And so the, the, uh, the teleoperation of surgery is another option, perhaps, depending on how far you are away from, from Earth. Probably a good option out to lunar uh, distances, but when you think about Mars, that's probably not going to do it either. 
But uh, again, I think that some of these technologies as we develop them, we're going to be able to support many more people here on Earth with the same high quality care that we, we enjoy in San Diego and our major cities. Uh, we can have uh, telementoring and, and uh, even teleoperation of, of uh, care. On the left here, this is a photograph that I took about six years ago, I think, in very remote Nepal. And it was amazing, even back then, the, the Sherpa people knew exactly where the direct line of sight was to the cell towers, you know, tens of miles away. And they would go to a point and they, they could, everybody had their own cell phone and everybody was online even back then. But of course, with uh, you know, Facebook and Google and other uh, uh, companies now looking to uh, basically provide uh, global internet access, these kinds of technologies can be distributed everywhere. Um, so I'm really excited about some of the technologies that are, that are coming about. Um, obviously, there are all sorts of point of care diagnostic and therapeutic solutions that are, that are being considered. And I'm running out of time, I see, so I'm going to go really fast. Um, but uh, Lazarus is a company that's actually able to print uh, essentially organs, so uh, tissues that, uh, um, or prints that actually have the same consistency as the native tissue and you could actually practice the surgery that you're about to do. So imagine just-in-time training where you have a case that you have to do on Mars or in sub-Saharan Africa or some other remote place. You could practice it first. You could print this out very easily, even the direct anatomy of your patient, and then go do it. Proximia is another company that actually uh, telementors and does uh, uh, remote uh, education of surgical procedures. I'm really excited to hear Jill and Lynn uh, talk about 3D4MD the ability to print tools just in time. And she's got a, a, a great presentation coming up. And then uh, a company that I'm affiliated with, 19 Labs, basically with smart algorithms and diagnostics and, and therapeutics, we can have very sophisticated tools in our homes, in our laboratories, in our, in our workshops, uh, and in remote environments. And when needed, talk to a physician or a nurse and guide through and make the right decision whether to treat in place or to be brought in uh, for definitive care. Um, so I'll just uh, talk about one of my real passions now. I'm, I've started a, a company called Fluidity uh, Technologies, but it actually harkens to the, the Mercury program. Back in the early days of space flight, wearing a big pressure suit, pilots couldn't really press on the, the rudder pedals of their spacecraft, so they needed to affect yaw control, swaying the, front, the nose of the vehicle in a different way. And so they created a rotary hand controller for yaw. And I've ultimately created a really disruptive way in a single hand to move throughout three-dimensional space, what we call six degrees of freedom of motion. Pitch, yaw, roll, X, Y, Z with great precision, without any cross-coupling, with very little training. And so th this is one of the, the technologies that sort of evolved based on my experience flying these different types of uh, vehicles as well as simulators. And now we have the ability to really make a disruptive change in, in, uh, in medicine and computer-aided design, virtual reality, augmented reality, and so on. Drone flight. So if any, I know there are many of you here in the room that are interested in these areas. I'd love to talk with you at some point uh, if you'd like to figure out some, some collaborations. But, um, and then, uh, how, how are we doing for time, Daniel? Sir? One minute, okay. So uh, I'll just talk very briefly uh, about another passion of mine, which is going to the high mountains. Has anyone read the book, Into Thin Air? Extraordinary book about what can possibly go wrong in one of the most unforgiving places on earth. And so I used it as a guidebook of what not to do. And, uh, and so I found a, a way to deliver hydration even at the summit of the coldest mountain on earth um, with some technology that we're, we're bringing to market now. Uh, and uh, just wanted to talk very briefly about the importance of teamwork as I wrap up here. Um, as an entrepreneur, I'm uh, especially strong as a creative and as an inventor, but I have limitations myself, and, and uh, so I, I realized that I only have a certain number of hours in the day, certain clock cycles, so I can only do one or two things really, really well. Um, but there are other opportunities to bring things to market. Um, so I know that there are a lot of clinicians here, perhaps not entrepreneurs without a lot of business experience. And so what's really important is to find the right team around you to help you 
bring things to market. I, I've, I've had my first uh, company when I was 12 years old. Uh, didn't do very well, but, uh, uh, but I've been an entrepreneur my entire life, and so I can manage certain things, but there's certain things that have fallen off the radar, like an invention that I uh, developed after having knee surgery uh, needed a way to conform to the knee and allow me to um, um, walk and also not to induce frostbite. And so I patented this, and uh, it could have just ended up a plaque in my, uh, on my I love me wall in, in the closet upstairs, you know, just a useless plaque. But I really wanted to get it to market, and I realized that I didn't have the time to do it. So the, the take home here is there are uh, innovation labs. This is the Innovation Institute in Newport Beach that I've been working with on this particular innovation. But uh, there are incredible uh, incubators and accelerators that can provide you help if, uh, if entrepreneurship and bringing things to market isn't your, your str strong suit. Uh, but you do need to build a, a strong team around you. And so the, the takeaways here, uh, extreme environments are great catalysts for innovation. Um, I think all of us have an obligation to innovate, try to try to make things better. And uh, you know, finding the right inter multidisciplinary team is, is the key. So thank you very much. I ran out of time, but uh, I'd love to talk with you later.